The Attorney General is in the House. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Always so many things to talk about with Peter Narona. I appreciate his accessibility. We'll uh, tick off a couple of matters, including his need to uh, secure the Attorney General's offices. I think the headline is probably a little bit more dramatic than the actual uh, conversation itself. But there are some things on the agenda that uh, I'd like to tick off, including uh, some of the uh, Second Amendment issues and some of the things going on with the communities. Uh, he will probably, I, I'm guessing that uh, he will not give me much on sports betting because now he's part of the case, but I shall probe anyway. In the meantime, headline, she did it. I knew she'd do it. Everyone knew she'd do it. She folded like a wilted lily. Politics is like that. Most things I do, it's people don't love it all, but I thought it was a fair compromise. Fair compromise because she had to give back to the employee unions. It's as simple as that. And you know what? The difficulty about this is that it makes people who argue the long term contract, evergreen contract, as it's called, issue, it, 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 it makes folks like us, or let me just say this for me. Uh, it, it offers the perception that we're anti-union, and that is not the case. That is not the case. Uh, just like the then treasurer, now governor, years ago stepped up with pension reform, she did some things that were hard. She did some things that were hard in an effort, in part, to make sure that people who had pensions kept them. We have a big pension problem in the municipalities, the likes of which is about 2.3 billion, with a B, dollars. They are part of the benefits that are now sustained in contracts from one contract to a next. In other words, a contract expires, everything remains the same monetarily until a new contract supplants that with this new legislation. The problem is, is that we have such a huge pension dilemma on a municipal level that without the tool to be able to carve into that on a town-by-town -town basis, what inevitably is going to have to happen here now is a state reform, not unlike what happened with the state side pensions. And it's going to be ugly. And it's going to have to supersede that which is going on with these contracts. And she just hasn't been honest about that. Uh, I guess years of being in the office just kind of wear you down politically. She said no to the same deal. They changed the, the semantics of it, but it was the same deal two years ago. The mayors walked in and said, we will threaten your re-election. Now they've got nothing to threaten because she is not looking to be reelected, at least to the governor's position, right? So we shall see over the course of time, but I'm really, really feeling terribly for the mayors who are hamstrung now and really without much to do other than to threaten layoffs. Charlie Lombardi, the North Providence mayor, is so frustrated, he called into the radio this morning, I heard him uh, say he's taking all the beds out of the fire department. Taking all the beds out. <laughs> uh, Charlie, you know, I mean, he's angry. And that's about the fire, fire overtime bill, which she just let go. Anyway, that's the conversation there. Uh, that's today's note it's just too bad and the taxpayers who uh that's you by the way who like <laughs> through this entire thing uh only wake up when you find out that your property tax bills are through the roof and that potholes aren't being filled and that kind of stuff uh on a national level this is kind of interesting the attorney general from connecticut has been uh, tapped to uh, well the attorney general taps uh, u.s attorney from connecticut to look into the entire Mueller investigation. It's really interesting. I have to ask our guest about this because of his expertise and former work as U.S. Attorney. Good evening. Thank you, sir. Dan, good to see you. What's your take on this? Investigating the investigation. This is something <laughs> Donald Trump has wanted to do. Tell me yeah. about this guy. You must know him. I don't, actually. Oh. I, don't, I don't know him. Oh. I, you know, I knew his predecessor very well, Deirdre Daly, who speaks highly of him. 
Uh, you know, this is, it's a little odd. You know, I don't remember this happening in the sense of sending cases out to the U.S. attorneys to do that would ordinarily, you know, be done in Washington. It's happened once before with John Huber, my former colleague who remained on in the, uh, as a U.S. attorney in, in uh, Utah. Um, I guess I'll say this, uh, that I expect it will be a short investigation because my, I believe that that investigation was handled appropriately. So if the investigation by the U.S. Attorney in Connecticut's done well and done right, it won't take very long to do it. Because I think what it'll conclude is that it was done the right way. So is it a pass off? Is it a, uh, uh, the president is just not going to quit on this. Let me, let me, let me find a, let me find a good space to deposit this particular situation. I have a guy who's respected mm -hmm. do a semi-thorough investigation of this whole thing and yeah. report back that there's no there there. You could think be. that's what this yeah, is? Yeah, it could be. Yeah, that that would make sense. You were similar, you know, career guy. This guy's a career guy. You were the guy in Utah. I can't remember what they sent to him, but it was something sensitive in the beginning of the Trump administration. So that's probably right. You know, Bark and say, look, we're having a professional look at it comes back, what, what what can really be challenged about it? So I don't think it'll take very long. You know, maybe it's putting a little salve on the president's uh, ill temper on this issue, and then we'll see where it goes. What do you think about the whole environment right now? Uh, it's not necessarily your, your bailiwick, but I mean, you're, you're certainly somebody who uh, loves the Justice Department mm -hmm. and, and, and believes in its purposefulness and the like. And now we've got a constitutional thing, you can call it a crisis, many people do, where even a subpoena uh, doesn't seem uh, to matter, and mm -hmm. the, and Congress's um, authority and co-equal existence is being challenged by the executive branch. Yeah, thought on it. Well, it came up a little bit in the Obama administration. You know, there the Eric uh, Holder had his problem. He did with right. uh, with the Republicans, um, and. Uh, Look, I think whether, regardless of what side controls uh, the House or the Senate, for that matter, uh, there's an oversight function, and sometimes those of us in the executive branch have to go up there and, and take our lumps and answer the questions and get asked the same question three times and answer it three times, and I, th I just think that's part of the job. If, if what you're doing um, is right and defensible, then go up there and defend it. I actually relish that opportunity. Uh, when I get asked about something, um, and it's something which I don't want to call it controversial, but something that could be interpreted the wrong way, I love that opportunity to explain what it is I'm doing and why I'm doing it, because I ought to be able to explain it, or I probably shouldn't be doing it. Hmm. So look, I think Attorney General Barr should go up there and answer the questions. Uh, if there's a privilege to assert that's legitimate, assert it, um, and let the chips fall where they may. That's the better course. It, it, you know, it, it builds confidence in our government to do it that way, I think. All right, good. Uh, we'll come back and talk about some state issues. We've got to beef up a little security around the Attorney General's office. Uh, I'm concerned about a lot of the sanctuary town stuff, and uh, we'll ask about the lawsuit on sports betting as well. Stay with us. I think, again, that the headline is probably a little bit more... Uh, Dramatic. Anytime you see the words armed guard, uh, people, ooh. Um, and some of the Second Amendment rights people have uh, taken that headline, mm. you know. Well, you need the protection. Well, and this happens uh, pretty much all of the give me, Give me the, the, the short um, stroke on, on what's sure. happening with security yeah. at the Attorney General's office. Yeah, so security at the office has always been handled. You know, I would say almost informally by our Bureau of Criminal Investigation uh, and Identification. They're mostly retired, but still active, uh, armed investigators for us. We have between five and six at any given time. They've always been based in Providence until last summer when they moved to the new office down in Cranston. So if we had somebody knocking on the door looking for a lawyer, and that's happened. You know, where's so-and-so? Where's so-and-so? People with mental health issues, quite frankly. Um, when those sensitive issues come up, uh, those guys were, and many women were always around to help out. So you could you could call a retired Providence detective; they can come out and help out with security. They're not there anymore, so it's incumbent on me to make sure that our security in the office is adequate for the 200, maybe a little less, but around 200 people who work in our main building on South Main Street and the one right next door. And so, how do we handle that? Do you know? Do we uh, Capitol Police is a possibility, but Capitol Police can't provide somebody for at the earliest. Um, uh, next year. So that's, I talked to Colonel Manny, that's just not viable at the moment. Do we privatize it? Do we have a security person there? Or do I cover it in-house another way? And I'm still weighing all those options. I'm not sure what I'll do yet. But I know this, I have to have an ability to protect my employees there. 
uh, I'm not worried about my personal protection, I'll be fine, but I'm worried about having, you know, a couple of people at the front office, at the desk at the front office who answer the phone, the BCI unit's gone. So I've got two people there who answer the phones every day. When someone walks in who poses a threat, then I need to be able to deal with that adequately, and so that's what we're working. I mean, the age. I mean, listen, you're 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 mixing with a lot of uh, unique characters. I mean, people, and, and there's a lot of tension that goes on with uh, folks who have cases and trials and like. And sure, we're doing uh, four thousand cases a year, Dan. Four thousand. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of emotion tied up in those cases. You know, serious domestic assaults that are felonies, homicides. Uh, sexual assaults. There's a lot of emotion. Do people show cases. up at the Attorney General's office looking for redress or answers on cases that are pending? It, it doesn't happen a lot, but it happens. I mean, we had an individual pounding on the door at 180 South Main Street looking for one of our lawyers. I mean, the person had mental health issues. I need somebody on the grounds who can handle that issue, right? What you worry about is that person getting in somehow. The door opens, it closes. You, you, need, you need vigilance there. Over the years, we've been able to handle that because we had those four or five trained, armed individuals on site. They're not there anymore. So I've got, you know, again, almost 200 people in Providence in two buildings, and I've got to have a means to protect well, them. It sounds uh, more operational than, than, than a big issue, but uh, we say guns, so let me ask you about, it's mm -hmm. got nothing to do with this conversation, but uh, you offered me your own perspective last week on the sanctuary town momentum. It seems like all of Western Rhode Island is, is having, a, having a moment here yeah. and sending a message to the State House, and I think on things that are just, that are well past that which is just gun rights. Uh, the executive director of the Rhode Island Police Chiefs Association, Sid Wardell, assured me that no police chief would veer from execution of the law. You asserted the same thing. But do you share the concern that I have, which is, this is a bad precedent. Sure, yeah, That, sure. that, that mm -hmm. you know, going rogue, so to speak, here is, uh, can give the impression that it's more than it is. That yeah. you can go into Burlville or Foster and not have to abide by the same laws that exist in town sure. because it's a sanctuary. Talk to me about it. Yeah, where does it end? You don't need a permit? Like I sign pistol permits all the time. You don't need a permit now in certain places. I'm not, this is not what they passed, but where does this stop, right? I mean, Again, the headline, I think, and the, and the drama of are probably superseding what they're actually doing. Well, right. And, and look, you know, the law is going to be enforced. It's going to be enforced by our office. It's going to be enforced by local chiefs. It's going to be enforced by the state police. It's going to be enforced by our federal colleagues. That's what's going to happen. I think, I think and you raised this last week when we were talking about it, and, and it's a good thought. And frankly, it, it didn't really register with me until you said it, which is, you know, if you're a police chief, I think particularly in small towns, you're doing a lot more than just law enforcement, right? The relationship between town government and a small town, a particular police chief, is varied and it, and it has to be close. Uh, and so does this put pressure on a small town police chief? I think, I have no doubt that those police chiefs will do exactly the right thing, but it does put them in a very difficult place. I agree. Tone. There's a tone problem in this country right now. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're right. Look, you know, we... Um, how do I put this? We, we Conflict we, resolution is not no, like it used to be. No, we depart from substance and we're out here on the margins on both sides, on both sides. And so, look, you, you can see this when you go into the State House today. Right? If you go, go up to the State House this afternoon, it's a raucous place right now. And, and a lot of this is new to me. As you attorney, it wasn't up there much, except when it involved the case we were doing, quite frankly. Uh, I'm up there more often now as we try to advance legislative agenda. Uh, but you you see, you don't see a lot of reasoned debate going on in the hallways. I'm not talking about the legislators themselves. I'm talking about in the hallways. There's a lot of really raw emotion in there. And um, it's a little alarming, frankly. Mm. Interesting. When we come back, we'll talk about some, uh, some pending matters. Uh, the Attorney General is soon to step into a review on this hospital merger thing. There's litigation on sports betting. Stay with us. You know, I, I'm very concerned uh, about the merger with Health New England, Care New England, and and partners in Boston, and the lifespan situation. We've had multiple shows on this here. What your your capacity in this really kicks in in the 90-day review period after mm -hmm. you judge the application for the merger to be complete. Complete. Mm -hmm. Is it complete yet? No. What do you need? Lots of things. 
Like, uh, well, you know, it, it's a lit, it's a long list. I think there were two hundred things on the list. So a lot of them were follow up questions. You know, things about um, uh, where you know. Where do you expect management to be vis-a-vis -vis the new organization? Should it be approved? What would that look like? Uh, what will we base here? So there's lots of things that are in those, those follow-up questions. The, the key is, once you review it, you want to have everything, right? You don't want to be doing a review and not have, every, have everything you need. So the team internally in, in our office and in the uh, Department of Health have worked really hard to make sure that we have everything that we need and we're waiting to get some of that some of those materials back. They're not they're not they're not back. It's fairly extensive. Look, this is a this is a complicated transaction that's gonna have a big impact if it were to be approved. And then we also have to look at it, make sure we're looking at it through the right lens. So what do I mean by that? So the Department of Health has its set of criteria under the Hospital Conversion Act, the relevant statute, and then we have ours. Ours involve things like charitable assets and corporate governance and um, um, and conflicts of interest. The Department of Health is, is different, as you might expect. It, it, it concerns more of the day-to-day -day delivery of health care, accessibility, affordability, quality, those kinds of things. So, you know, we're working together to make sure that we're getting everything we need to analyze this proposed transaction based on that set of criteria. I think I think one of the pressures I feel, just to, just to be perfectly candid about it, is, is that there's Obviously, we want to get this right. We have to get this right for the people of the state of Rhode Island. But one of the things, one of the pressures that I feel is that, you know, we're looking at it from my office's perspective, according to a very strict sense of criteria, and I think the public expects it to be broader. We're going to be as broad as we can under that set of criteria. But, and I think collectively with the Department of Health, we have, we have the, the standards we need to make it right. But, but it's a really broad issue, and at least from our office, those criteria, corporate governance, conflict, um, charitable assets, is, is pretty narrowly focused. I think the other thing that I think is really missing in Rhode Island is we don't have, at least I've never seen, and I've asked a lot of people for this while I was running and, and even since, a, a, a health care strategy that really defines how we deliver care. How many hospitals do we need? Are they located in the right place? Do they have the right number of beds? How much health care should we, we be doing sort of internal to a large health care organization? And how much health care ought to exist kind of on its own independently to drive innovation and to keep costs down and keep competition in the marketplace? I don't know how much of that thinking we're doing. I think we certainly need to do it. What makes these transactions difficult, Dan, is that we don't have that construct to put them in context, whether you're the Department of Health doing it kind of on over in their lane or when we're doing it in ours. Yeah, because you've got two agencies, yours and the Department of Health, that are regulatory in nature and not, and not um, you know, they're not maestros. You're not maestros organizing that which you think we should have. But that's probably a legislative act action. And, well, look, and, I, and, yeah. and, and, right? So... Uh, uh, I'll tell you this much, uh, I, I would imagine that you're feeling the pressure on this because it is contentious, uh, lifespan and its ad campaign right now, uh, very aggressive. You know, they say things here that they, and differently than they say things on their, their marketing and advertising. Uh, they really have done a pretty good job of, of scaring the bejesus out of everybody here in the mm -hmm. state over uh, how bad this is going to be. I'm not certain, uh, based on multiple interviews with the CEOs and, 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 and some pretty high-level docs, I'm not even certain yet how, we, how, how I come down on this whole thing. Um, so you're going to have a lot to do, and mm -hmm. it'll, be, it'll be interesting to see if you're, if you're able to sketch out of your lane uh, well, on this whole thing. If you feel like you need to be entrepreneurial about mm -hmm. this. Uh, yeah, yeah, so let me, let me just say two things. Number one is that um, I've got a really good team. It was my priority when I got to the office was to make sure that nothing was secondary to that partner's team. In fact, we had a lawyer who was going to try a large defensive case for the state, and I and I took her off that case. She was our our health point, health uh, care point of contact. I needed her focus full time on this and built a strong team around her, including the deputy attorney general. And I stay engaged in it too. So that's number one, mm -hmm. best possible team. Uh, and the other part too, and this is I think equally important. I have not met with anybody about this offline. What I mean offline is taking a meeting with anybody, Lifespan, Care New England, uh, Renowned Medical Society, nobody. I'm not talking about this issue outside the public content uh, comment period, right? This has all got to be, frankly, above board and public, 
right? There are no sidebar conversations with me about this. What well, everyone's views. Are you about, watching shows and listening to shows? No, no, not really. No, no. So, so hmm. you know, lifespan can go on its campaign. God bless them. They've got a job to do to protect their interest. What I'm going to see and what I'm going to be interested in is what's filed in the public sector. Everybody's going to have a right to weigh in. Is anybody this. slow playing this thing? I mean, uh, either side are they slow playing the application process? Uh, oh, I don't think so. I, no, I don't no. think so. I think you know. I think that. You mean in terms of us as regulators? No, in terms of uh, in, in, in the two entities. Are, the, are, they, no. are they are they giving what you need in a, in a timely fashion? I because think because New England's got a, a, more than an itch to scratch to get this deal done. Well, that's why I, th I think they want to get it done. I, you know, we want to make sure we have everything so that when we trigger that 90-day review process, we can get it done. Obviously, in that 90-day period, and and again, this is this is a really complicated uh, transaction with a lot of questions that we've got to get answered. All right, we'll uh, we'll keep in touch on that. Sports betting uh, is now uh, part of litigation. Attorney Joe Larissa and Brandon Bell um, filed on behalf of the former politician in, in Rhode Island. Uh, the uh, State House wants to characterize this as a kind of a Republican coup attempt. Uh, I think there are legitimate arguments to be made. By the way, sports betting, I'm fine with. Mm -hmm. I think there's a constitutional question here. Uh, I know you can say only limited things about it, but you're confident the state is in a good legal position. Yeah, and you're and you feel good about defending the state. I do. Yeah. So I, I think it's important to understand our role here. You know, as attorney, as uh, attorney general's office on the civil side. You know, under the statute, um, we are required to defend the state when asked. Um, by the way, I have some issues with that sometimes. There are times when I don't want to, and I wish we didn't have to. On the defensive side, I mean, the civil division has two main functions, defend the state and sue on behalf of the state. I much prefer being on offense. I think we can do a lot of good there. Environmental enforcement's a good example of that. But our, but our obligation is to defend the state. Now, not to defend the state if I think the defense would be frivolous or not supported by the law. So what happens in a case like this? And I can't talk about it specifically because we're in litigation and we speak in court. But we go through the same process, and we look at the look at the complaint, we look at what our defenses are, we analyze them, and we decide whether we believe it's defensible. I believe this lawsuit is defensible. We should defend it, and that's what we're going to do. Hmm. You say all the right things. Uh, I can't wait for your arguments, though, because uh, I, I don't think the question was asked to the people. And I just think that the, the General Assembly made such a bonehead decision to go ahead and put this up without putting it on the ballot, and it would have synced right in. It would have synced right in. They could have done it for November and been up and running in June and not missed a beat. Instead, this thing dangles and you'll have to defend. Uh, I'll be watching that hearing, though. This is going to be a, it's going to be fascinating. Well, that's not that unusual, right? We're constantly defending decisions that are made by the state. Sometimes, I, you know, I look at them and I go, yeah, you know, well, this is what we have to do. I'm not talking about this case. But it comes up, mm -hmm. and that's our job, and so we do it. All right. Appreciate it. Good to visit. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks, Dan. Uh, final word when we come back. Stay with us. Tomorrow, speaking of Care New England, we're going to have a local business guy who says that he is representing manufacturers here in this state who are as well concerned about this lifespan Care New England merger. Uh, he's threatened to run for office a couple of times, almost did, announced with Lieutenant Governor and then bailed. Uh, he's one of our interesting characters here in Rhode Island. Carl Waddenston will be here tomorrow night. Uh, to talk about this. I know he believes that Lifespan and Care New England should find each other in health care marriage here, uh, as do many people in this state. But so far, the courtship hasn't been, it's been long and tedious. So he'll be here tomorrow. Talk to you on the radio at 3 until 6 on WPRO. Thanks for tuning in. Good night.